Thank you, David Rogers. Welcome, everybody, to the Invisible Disabilities Webinar. Welcome, everybody, to the Invisible Disabilities Webinar. This is the Unitarian Universal Church in Newton Community. Uh, this is from the Universalist Unitarian, excuse me, Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene Community. And I'm the chair of the Accessibility Task Force. And I'm the chair of the Accessibility Task Force. Rev. Jen, our minister, will join us later. Rev. Jen, our minister, will join us later. But first, in our tradition, we begin with a chalice lighting. But first, in our tradition, we begin with a chalice lighting. And this is a quote from Helen Keller. And this is a quote from Helen Keller. I am conscious. I am conscious of a soul sense. Of a soul sense. That lifts me. <clears throat> that lifts me above the narrow cramping circumstances. Above the narrow cramping circumstances of my life. Of my life. My <laughs> physical limitations. My physical limitations are forgotten. Are forgotten. My world lies upward. My world lies upward. The length and the breadth and the sweep of the heavens are mine. The length and the breadth and the sweep of the heavens are mine. And my, my wonderful wife, Deborah, lift the chalice for us. And my wonderful wife, Deborah, lit the chalice for us. Read be me is the main Ian. Repeating me is the amazing Ian. Thank you, Patrick, for doing our ASL. Thank you, Patrick, for doing our ASL. And we also have Andrew and Stephen. And we also Andrew. Oh, oh. Michael and Andrew. And well, we also. And we also here have Michael and Stephen. Michael and Stephen, I guess I'm human. Michael and Stephen, and I guess I'm human. And Kat is so big tech. And Kat is helping on tech. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. And um, so in can you uh, bring me back upper left? Upper left? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. I'd like to introduce you, Reverend Fast. I'd like to introduce you to the Reverend Suzanne Fast. The Reverend Suzanne Fast. The, the Reverend Suzanne Fast. She, her. She, her pronouns. Is a Unitarian Universalist Community Minister. Is a Unitarian Universalist Community Minister. Focus. Uh, disability justice. Focusing on disability justice. Advocacy. Advocacy. Education. Education. And pastoral ministry. And pastoral ministry. Primarily through UU Association Equal Access. Primarily through the UU Association's Equal Access. I'd like to add a personal. And I'd like to add a personal note. I have had the privilege of being in several small groups. I have had the privilege of being in several small groups. Of other UUs with disabilities. Of other UUs with disabilities. And uh, Rev. Suzanne. And Rev. Suzanne. Has always been supportive. And inclusive. Has always been supportive and inclusive. Warm and identify as having lived experience. Warm and identifying as having lived experience. What a uh, treasure for us to discuss invisible disabilities. 
What a treasure for us to be able to discuss invisible disabilities. From Florida, Reverend Suzette Fast. So from Florida, Reverend Suzanne Fast. Hey all, and thank you, David. Thank you for all of y'all for making this possible. This is wonderful. It's such a, a, a joy and, a, and an honor to be here with you. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how we want to go about this, but you know we're a, uh, a small group and we can, uh, we can figure out how to share because what I don't want to do is give you a lecture about things that you're not interested in. So let's not do that. Um, as David said, my, my ministry mm -hmm. is primarily um, focused on uh, disability justice and education, um, advocacy work. I've been doing that for oh, more than 10 years now, um, but it has been a super joy for me to be doing a lot more now with our own uh, community of disabled UUs. And it's been a, a wonderful um, change in what I do and um, just an amazing opportunity to really um, focus on what all of the things that I've been working on to get non-disabled UUs to think about and understand what ableism is and to know it when they find it and all of that work, it means a whole lot more when we also get an opportunity to be together, even though we may be hundreds or thousands of miles apart. It's one of the beauties of the new technology that's brought us all together. And just to put my, my other bona fides right on the table, uh, I do have uh, both physical, uh, visible disabilities. Um, and that's what people think of sometimes. They've seen me dashing around General Assembly in my scooter or whatever. Um, but actually, I have um, uh, a chronic illness I've uh, had for 30 years now. Uh, that's not visible and uh, affects my life, frankly, far more than the fact that I can't climb steps or, or stand still in a pulpit. Um, and then I'm also neurodivergent. So again, that's another kind of, of invisible disability. Um, and when you really um, stop and pause and, and think about the, the reality, there's so many people with so many invisible disabilities or so many kinds of invisible disability. And society likes to overlook them and pretend they're not there um, and focus on things that have very obvious, well, you know, let's put a ramp here and then you know, Suzanne can get onto the chancel. Let's put a ramp here so that everybody can come into church and move around in coffee time and actually use the restroom when they need to. We, we focus on those things. We focus on the hearing loops because so many of us benefit from them and it's concrete, it's tangible. You can put it in the budget. But there's so many of us, so many of us with um, chronic illnesses, so many of us who are neuro neurodivergent, so many of us who have a uh, um, mental health issue of various sorts. And it's all complicated, you know, there's so much. And you know, there are some ways, we don't like to think it too much, but there are a lot of ways where Unitarian Universalists are really a whole lot like everybody else. I mean, there are ways we're not, but there are ways that we are. And the fact that we're, we're acculturated in this society is part of that. And so people don't know what they don't know, right? And, um, and 
most of us like to think that we know the lay of the land. We know how things work. And so, so much of, of, of what we're faced with in interaction and, and in the way we talk and, and think with each other is really based on a, a narrow set of norms. And I don't know about you, but it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I am not especially nervous if I don't know the answer or I don't do something right. But I've cultivated that, you know, it's, it's a good professional skill for me, but it's, it's also part of um, some of the, the soul work and the growth work, right, that our faith asks us to do is to um, to get more comfortable with the idea that we're just people and we're not perfect and we don't know everything. And I think that's kind of been the pinch point lately around people suddenly becoming more free to, of talking about our invisible disabilities and people in the society becoming more cognizant, more more accepting of the idea that there's a lot going on in people's lives that they don't know about. But I think sometimes when we run into um, feeling not particularly um, at ease in our congregations, it's because we, we don't know the right thing to say and we worry about saying the wrong thing or we don't even think about the idea that maybe somebody has invisible disabilities and maybe that's why they always say no when you ask them to do this thing because it's, it's not something that's gonna be comfortable for them even though it's comfortable for me. There's just so many pieces, so many pieces where this comes into play just in our church communities. And so, David, when you give an invitation to talk about invisible disabilities, my feeling was there's so much. There's so much. It's so rich. Our lives are amazing. And we all benefit from when we get to be who we are in a place like church. And so I'm really happy to, to be here. I will talk about things that, you know, I know I can talk about things about equal access. I can talk about, you know, the work that's happening in Unitarian Universalism. But the reality is, is what's important is what's happening here in this community of almost 40 people who've gathered today. And so I'm gonna pause and I'm hoping that uh, you will steer us for where we're gonna go next. Well. Thank you, Reverend Suzanne. Well, thank you, Reverend Suzanne. Before we go further, I wanted to ask one first question. So before we go further, I wanted to ask one first question. This is Memorial Day weekend. So of course, this is Memorial Day weekend. And many veterans and civilians are caught up war. And many veterans and civilians have been caught up in war. Such as those in the Ukraine. Such as those in Ukraine. And uh, I would add caught up by shootings in schools and air in everyday life. And I would add that uh, people caught up in school shootings um, and I missed the last one. It's making our, our neighborhoods war, war places. It's making our neighborhoods war places. Anyway, I have PTSD. Anyway, I have PTSD. So sometimes this is visible. So sometimes this is visible. But sometimes it's invisible. But sometimes it's invisible. How it you are, uh, how would this differ for you, for instance, when 
an invisible or invisible. How would this differ for you, for instance, it's, when it's visible or when it's invisible? It's real to us. It's real to us. Is that discrimination? Is it discrimination? Well, the there's certainly opportunity for there to be discrimination um, when. when people don't give consideration to the fact that we don't all have the same experiences. And when we sort of wanna gloss over people's experiences or not hear them or not uh, acknowledge them, that's, that's a form of ableism. Um, when we want to not make the kind of space that people need in order to be able to participate, that's discrimination. Um, so for example, for, for people who live, live with the after effects of trauma, there's so much that can bring those things up. Um, I, I experienced that myself. Um, I, have a, I have a trauma history of my own. And um, sometimes I need, I need space. Sometimes I need um, somebody who I know I trust to be there, or um, sometimes I know um, that I'm not the best person to talk about X, Y, or Z, and I will arrange for somebody else to carry that conversation because I know it'll be hard for me to be present because it's, it's work, it's hard work when you're when your trauma is um, being poked at, it's hard work to stay balanced and to stay in the conversation with other people and facilitate things and all of those sorts of things. And so one of the things that we need to be able to do is to accommodate for those sorts of things. Um, you know, for, um, for people who uh, personally carry the ravages of war, that's a thing that um, I have no personal experience of, but I see the weight of that in people. And our society isn't always very charitable about that. And we don't always give people the space to, to distance when they need to distance, but also to not feel like they're abandoned in the process. And that's work that we can, we can learn to pay attention. And we can learn to just accept other people in the way that they need. You know, people shouldn't have to spill their trauma all over the table for us to, to listen when they say, yeah, no, I can't do that. You shouldn't need to have a big explanation from people. We can be supportive when that's wanted, but we're not entitled to somebody's story. And finding that balance, that's tricky. Oh, yeah, I like the idea. We need social justice, whether or not our disabilities are visible. I like the idea that we need social justice, whether or not our disabilities are visible. 
irrelevant, really. Because that's irrelevant, really. Uh, Mr. M Mr. Michael Young has a question for us in this wonderful repeat. Mr. Michael Young had a question for us, and his father will repeat. Well, uh, um, there are ways that we can include our The one with invisible disability. What are some good ways that we can include someone with an invisible disability? Oh yeah, and we can show the, the quest any questions if we don't bring that to the camera. Yeah, okay. I got you. Uh, That's fine. Oh, yeah. The camera's auto adjusted. That's a superb question there. That is a superb question there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, It's a funny thing for congregations, right? Because um, we want to be inclusive in some sort of abstract kind of thought, but part of it is everybody's disability is different. And so what really makes the, the changes happen is cultivating, cultivating that feeling of everybody belongs here um, in the sense of anybody uh, whatever body whatever mind that's that's not a reason we want people to not be here you know I mean we've all got every congregation has you know theological things and other things that we kind of coalesce around but how do we bring that from this abstract idea, right? Into, into how we really are together. And part of that is um, how do we make it, how do we make it feel like it is actually really okay to say, um, I don't like to be touched. How do we make it really safe to say, um, how can we figure out a way so that um, I'm not getting sensory overload from what's happening in worship? Um, can we think together about how to make something uh, happen so that I get a good worship experience and it just becomes a part of the way we do things. And it's hard to convey that because I don't know if you've had the experience, I have occasionally, of people want so much to help that they just overwhelm you when you come in the door. And like, gee, I was really here to just sort of sit in the back and check this place out and see whether I want to get to know you all that much. And so it's, it's hard to, to find the sweet spot, the balance point between that kind of aggressive eagerness and the kind of, no, really, we want to know um, what we can do that will make that will make our place a place you want to come and come back and come back and. And to have the patience to let folks get to know our congregations a little bit in their own way and not decide that they're, you know, antisocial or they're aloof or they're whatever, um, or, you know, 
you know, why does she talk to herself or why this or why that? But to just let people be for a while and just kind of decide whether they f feel like divulging things. Nobody should have to, to, you know, say stuff right off the bat just to get in the door. We need to, to, to learn to be more relaxed around difference. Yes, very good. Rev, bath, rev, thank you. Rev, Suzanne. Very good. And yes, Rev, Suzanne. Brian, Brian, from our congregation sent us a question. Brian from our congregation sent us a question. I, but first, I'd like to encourage any listeners who have questions to use your raised hand question. But first, I would like to encourage any listeners on Zoom we have to use the raise hand feature to indicate you have a question. Webinar feature. Yeah, it's a webinar feature. So Brian said this topic of access. So Brian said this on the topic of access. Is extremely connected or all things related to challenges and abilities. He said a topic that's connected to all things related to challenges in abilities. So very much connected to the spirit of the welcoming congregation. And also it's very much connected to the spirit of a welcoming congregation. His question is, can we as a religious body as a whole be better about making that connection? So his question is, can we as a religious body as a whole be better about making that connection? Yes. Um, it's, it, it's, I will, I will say, I, I believe we are better than we were and that we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. But part of that is this ongoing work of talking about what is ableism? What what it means to uh, to discriminate in this kind of way? How this is not part of our values? It runs counter to our values. That all of the work that we do to profess uh, that um, everyone has inherent worth um, needs to mean everyone, and that when we talk about the importance of interdependence, that we you know, maybe want to learn something from folks who have a lot of lived experience of interdependence, like a lot of the disabled people that I've come to know in life. So yeah, there's a lot to do. And I at least feel that it has changed slowly, but it is changing. Yes, I agree. And uh, I believe it anti racist of folks have felt lead the way. Yes, I agree. And I believe that the anti racism folks have helped lead the way. We are proud that our church adopted the eighth principle. We are proud that our church adopted the eighth principle to dismantle racism. To dismantle racism? And, uh, I talked to the, one of the ministers in Beloved Conversations. And I talked to one of the ministers in Beloved Conversations. She pointed out that class is one of the big hurdles. And she pointed out that class is one of the big hurdles. I mean, that connects so many issues. And I mean, that connects so many issues. Yeah. So, uh, folks, uh, be sure to click the sign that you want to ask a question 
and Dave Rogers is going to play a little bit more in, folks. Take the question. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Ian has a question. Yeah, here, I'll try to be more in view here. One of my main caregivers. Yes. Brilliant. Ian. Well, as David says, I'm one of his main caregivers and allegedly brilliant. My name's Ian. Uh, I really like what you said about uh, just kind of creating the general basis for being more accepting of people with invisible disabilities. But there's kind of a side question that I think maybe you have some expertise on this. So for folks with invisible disabilities, um, including say myself, I don't really call myself disabled, but I am neurodivergent very distinctly. Um, it can be a little bit, I put this, embarrassing to divulge, even if you're not using the word of your diagnosis, it can feel embarrassing to be like, oh, this is too many people. I suddenly can't understand what anyone's saying, which happens to me a lot, or too many were talking to me at once and now I literally don't know what's going on, you know, but it feels embarrassing because it makes you feel kind of like you're like, oh, I'm just a little kid, you know, I don't know. And it kind of puts you in that weird position. So what can those of us who all have invisible disabilities, who are neurodivergent or have other challenges that aren't immediately obvious, do to better connect with people in our communities, whether it's church. I know I've had this issue in synagogues I've been to and in political spaces where it feels like either you kind of have to embarrass yourself by admitting, you know, it feels awkward. You know, how can you overcome that awkwardness and to just state what you need in a situation or in a community? It's not easy, is it? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's part of what I mean about um, it's on our, our organizations, our, our congregations, our um, other uh, institutions, not in the big I sense, but in the, in the organizational sense. It part of, it's part of why it's so important for us at that level to be creating a culture of acceptance. Uh, so, you know, it, it would be great if any congregation that you wanted to go to you could look on their, you know, you could check out their website ahead of time and it would tell you things about the congregation that might uh, help you, including who to talk to, you know, it would be great if um, ushers and greeters and all were, were uh, part of their training and, and, and part of the ethos that they bring to the work is to not ask a lot of questions it, beyond you know, how can we make this more comfortable? Um, you're right, in so many ways, Ian, there's a kind of a, a pressure that arises from the inside almost to explain and I gotta explain or I'm not gonna get what I need. And um, that's hard to resist, but I, I find when I just make the ask for what I need, in an unfamiliar situation, the response often tells me a lot about the place and how ready they really are for a kind of broad acceptance of me, but of other, other folks as well. But, you know, finding, finding the places where you feel, comfortable enough to make the, the ask itself. And I'll tell you, for me, sometimes the places where it's been really low stakes have been great because I'll just ask and I won't explain and I'll just ask. And then, you know, it's like any kind of building up of a muscle, you know, you do it and then you do it again in another place in another time. And sooner or later, you're just doing it without having to psych yourself up, if you'll excuse the expression. Um, <laughs> and um, having places where you can talk about it too. Others, you know, other places, places where you're connected with other people who just get it, um, where you can say, you know, I tried to go to this doctor or I tried to go, to this store uh, and it was it was a nightmare and just being able to say that to somebody without having to super duper explain 
Zoom has done so much of that for me. I have an audio processing disorder among many other things and captions are amazing for me. And I'll go to places and I'll ask, you know, can you turn on the captions? And, you know, most people I think still think about captions in terms of um, uh, uh, a hearing loss or, or being hard of hearing. Well, I, I'm slightly hard of hearing. I'm, I'm getting to be an old lady. Um, but no, that's not why I need them. But I don't have to explain why I need them. I just ask for it. And they're so much more available than they used to be. David, we have a, we have a few questions in the chat. And one of them is a quick question that's related to something that was just talked about. And that's please define neurodivergent as used in this webinar. Can you please? Yep. Reverend Sorry. Susan, if you could please uh, explain to us neurodiversity. Neurodivergent. Pardon me, neurodivergence. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm just somebody who lives with it, but I'll do my best. Um, there are, um, brains are wired differently. They're not all the same. And our society is built for certain, certain kinds of, um, of ways that, that our minds work. And so when I say I'm neurodivergent, what I'm talking about is, yes, the audio processing disorder, but I'm also talking about the fact that I'm ADHD. But uh, it also includes folks who are um, uh, autistic. Uh, my husband is dyslexic. Um, many, many different ways that the brains are wired. And, um, and different neurologies um, have different ways of encountering the world that feel comfortable. Um, now, like I say, I am not an expert at on this at all. I know some, some folks that I work with uh, include um, uh, other uh, mental health um, uh, diagnoses of various sorts as part of neurodivergence. I know other folks who really prefer to keep those ideas separate. And I, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a personal uh, knowledge to know what is the best way to go about framing that. Uh, but I will say that um, the, the kinds of uh, lines that people draw between the plethora of mental health diagnoses and uh, and the trauma diagnoses and the, the learning disabilities and all feels very artificial to me. David, there are several questions. How would you like to handle that? I know you have some pre um, questions already. So there are three other questions in chat. Okay, so David Rogers, can you just play one chorus from the Kirkby song because you don't have a lot of time left. Oh, sure. Well, I'll sing it a little higher with the capo up. That'll make some difference. <laughs> this will be, yeah. Oh, I'm a little cookie. Actually, I think I'll bring it off the cookie and try this. <laughs> oh, I'm a little cookie. Yes, I am. I was made by the cookie man. I'm away from the cookie pan. A little piece broke off of me. Now I ain't as round as I can be, but I'll taste good. Just wait and see. And I can love back just twice as hard. Better believe it. As a regular cookie can. David Rogers. Mainly, Jerry. And disability 
in Lane County. And he's one of the main leaders in disability in Lane County. What a drugs for, for a heart congregation. What a treasure for our congregation. Can't thank you kindly for that, David. Uh, get to the first questions from the audience. Matt, uh, can we get to the three questions now from the audience? All right. Um, the first one is, how can we help people become aware of assumption that, quote, standard base hu model human, end quote, is white, cis, straight, neurotypical, able-bodied, that then has to be changed as awareness of individual differences come to light? So how can we help people change that awareness? Uh, deep. Understand, Rob, Susan. Good time. Did you understand that question, Reverend Suzanne? Sure. Um, talk about it. Talk about it. Um, put. put interesting articles about it in places where people might come across them. Um, maybe preach about it. Maybe preach about it as part of the work that we're doing to dismantle oppression. Um, maybe talk about it in terms of the work that we're doing to be uh, radically welcoming. Uh, maybe talk about it in terms of um, our values and who do we want to be and how do we want to live our faith. There are so many doorways for talking about uh, how to truly welcome and not leave people behind. Uh, have, have some accessible fun stuff. Um, it's where people can get to know people on a casual basis, uh, where, where we all get to just be who we are, you know? Um, let the disabled leaders in your congregation shine and not just always talking about disability, you know, but some folks who aren't identifying as disabled, you know, can also talk about disability and disability justice and inclusion, um, not as excluding disabled folk talking about our own uh, experiences, but, uh, but as part of, this is about we, you know? Everybody loses when we don't draw on all the talents of the people who wanna be here. Thanks. So, Kat. Are uh, there two more questions? And you said there were two more questions that we yes. had in the chat. Yes. Um, let me find it. Okay. Uh, how do we? Oh, wait. Sorry. I was reading the same one. How do we get? people without disabilities to be interested in learning and accommodating uh, those with disabilities? Uh, good, good question. Good question. Our motto is, access is every person's issue. Our motto is, access is every person's issue. I was surprised that our church was so little oh, I can't go here and defend. I was surprised when uh, some of our church said, oh, I can't go to your events. I'm not disabled. I'm not disabled. I feel like a white person saying, I don't work with racism. I'm white. It would be like a white person saying, I don't work on racism, I'm white. You cried. Go ahead, Rep. Suzanne. 
some of that I think is a, um, about disabled folks ourselves being clear about whether we're wanting a space to be for us or we're wanting it to be a space where we're all together. Both have uh, a place in what we do. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's uh, really helpful to, to have a space that's just for us, um, where, I mean, even in, in any cross disability space, it's already challenging, right? Because some of us, the accommodations that one person needs are just exactly the opposite of what somebody else needs. It's hard. And yet, you know, and our experiences are widely different, partly based on, you know, our lived experience of disability and partly because of all the rest of our, of ourselves and our experiences. So a, dis, a, a space for us to be together is already a challenging space to, to make and to hold and to build community. But it is important sometimes, at least for some of us, to have those spaces where there are some things at least we don't have to explain. Um, and where the assumption is that people are disabled. Um, and sometimes it's great in those spaces if, if you've got the right mix of people, the right number of people, that some folks who aren't disabled are in the space uh, because they can manage in a disabled space. But then there's a whole set of other times, right, where, where we're talking about issues and we're talking about um, uh, changes, uh, changes in the the broader culture of the congregation, for example, where we want the space that everybody can come into the space and listen and, and learn. And, uh, and those spaces are super important. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of having the energy to want to take, to create those, those spaces and those opportunities, because uh, they can be it can be wearying, right? Um, so, um, so let me take a second from this question to, to, to talk about things that we have tried and are doing at the, at the national and, and continental level. Um, because it's funny when, when we arranged to do this, David, and I sent you the biography, um, I was talking about the Accessibility and Inclusion Ministry Program, which is a, a, a deep intensive program for congregations to intentionally work on changing their culture around disability. And um, that was before we had made the decision that we are actually closing that program uh, at the end of June. And that's a program that was developed by Equal Access and in partnership with the UUA, um, but it's been run for 10 years now by volunteers. And um, we've had seven congregations complete the program since it, that includes our, our pilot congregations and then the congregations that came in when we released it to the general UU uh, population in 2015. Congregations were not ready for that kind of intensive, deep commitment. We didn't have the foundation built. And it's been a hard thing to, to learn and to, 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 to try and, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out why isn't, you know, why isn't there more engagement? But the foundational work wasn't there. Congregations just were not seeing this as an essential part of living our values and doing our anti-oppression work. And, you know, it's hard. I mean, this is a program I've given a chunk of my heart to now for 10 years. And it's, it's, it's hard to say this, but, 
one of the things that has happened in that 10 years is that we've been doing a lot of work with the UUA talking about disability justice, talking about anti-ableism. And, you know, you drip, 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 drip these things for a long time, all the time. And sure enough, some things start to change. And so right now we're in the process of working out arrangements and, and agreements between equal access and the UUA, where the UUA, the Association of Congregations is going to be taking up the work of working with congregations around issues of access and inclusion, not a dedicated group of volunteers over here. And so that's in transition. It's gonna take some time for them to figure out what that's gonna look like and it's gonna change over time. But it's hard to say, oh, you know, the AIM program didn't succeed because I don't know that these changes of locating this work where it needs to be located at the Association of Congregations, I don't know that it would have happened if we hadn't had 10 years of experience with the AIM program. So yes, congregations can do things and people can get involved and, um, and there are, there are things about accessibility available even now on the Equal Access website for congregations um, that will take, take a, you know, you can, you can do them individually, singly, um, take it into your congregation to talk about. Um, so it's not like there's no resources in this transition time, but we're in a transition time. So hopefully there'll be some interesting new resources and new ways. And, um, and we can all be part of creating things, right? I'm thinking a lot about the new technologies that we've, we have gotten such wide acceptance of around, uh, around our faith uh, in these last couple of years. Um, and how maybe we can have more ways for congregations to be in touch with each other for mutual support around issues. Um, and what works? What worked here? What worked there? It's not all going to be the same. But we can do a lot, I think, with sharing of our experiences of uh, how, how we got more folks in our congregations to understand the vital importance of doing this, not just because, you know, we love so and so and want them to be able to, to stay part of our congregation, but because this is who we are. Thanks. Now I can start it a little late. So go a little late. Thanks. And now we started just a little late, so we'll go just a little late. So, Michael, you have a thank you. Question. No, 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 no. No, no. Okay. okay. No. Are there any other questions from folks? Yeah, we have two questions left here. Um, okay, so I can't. Go ahead. And thank you. Why do you think visible disabilities are more easily validated and accommodated than invisible ones? Well, for one thing, folks have been organized a lot longer, right? Um, mm -hmm. Some of the earliest disability rights work was done, I think, between World War I and World War II, and uh, done by, uh, by veterans with visible disabilities. Um, and uh, then the, the heyday of disability rights work in the 1970s and 80s and then leading into the, the ADA in 1990, uh, a lot of that work was done 
uh, around physical barriers. Physical barriers was something that the public could be, you know, grasp, could, could understand. If I can't ride the bus, I can't go to work. You know, it was a very practical thing that with all of those wonderful demonstrations uh, in, the, in the late 1970s. Um, the, um, so I, I, I really think some of it has to do with what society is aware of. And some of it, it has to do with people getting organized. Um, but what, what we're experiencing now, I think, is that a lot more people who used to mask their disability from the world and you know, do their very best to present to the world as, as typical as possible, um, are saying, yeah, no, that is just not a good use of my talent and my energy and the world needs to get over it. Um, I think a lot of us who live with chronic illness, you know, I've talked a lot today about my neurodivergent disability side, but living with a chronic illness is the, is the thing that has uh, had an enormous impact on my life. A lot of people with chronic illness in this world. And thanks to COVID, we're going to have a whole lot more of them. And so I think people, people will become more aware that there are a lot of things that limit people's participation in our society beyond the ones that they can see, you know, when somebody has, you know, an advertisement and, oh, look, here's a disabled person, you know, and I look at that thing and I say, well, yeah, okay, so here's somebody with a rollator and there's somebody with a scooter and, and look at all those other people. Odds are there are some disabled people over there too, but nobody thinks about that. I think we're, I think we're changing on that as a society. I think we're getting a little bit of a clue. I agree. I agree. And I can, I think anti-racism <laughs> has helped open doors for us all. So can't you some doors? One final question. One final question. Uh, I like the captions because I also need notes to help me remember things uh, and to focus when I take my own notes but also have a reading, I also have a reading issue as well. The lines get so blurred and are so fast about different, differing person's needs, it makes it difficult to implement. What are ways you have found to implement yeah. the things you have been talking about? Um, well, one of the things that I, um, grateful for in the in the way that zoom for example continues to add to its uh its capacities is that not only does it give the scrolling um captions but you can turn on the transcript and so you can actually go back a ways and see something if you if you miss something um it's and and have it more or less in the same window so that you don't completely lose the thread of what's happening in the, in the conversation part. Um, that has been good. It, it certainly is not the greatest thing in the world, but you know, it, I mean, it makes lots of mistakes, but uh, I remember back when I was first using um, uh, speech to text dictation software, um, 25 years ago and um, it had you had to train it to your voice this thing picks up everybody's voice it's amazing um, but it needs work um, I, I don't have good answers for the particular thing that you're raising um, I I'm always experimenting and trying to accommodate things like one of the things that zoom does not do right, is give captions in a breakout room. So I feel really lucky because I use uh, an app on my phone called Live Transcribe. 
It's not the reason that they developed the app. I think they developed the app for people to have conversations in the same room with each other where somebody needs a transcription of it. But I use it in the breakout room because it'll give me captions of what's going on and being said in the breakout room. Um, I, I think we, we need to, to keep experimenting and let's ask Zoom, hey, can you put this on their, your, the list of things you keep adding? Um, and, and then it's not a very sophisticated answer, but it's what I got. Hey, you're, you've done. And, uh, yes, it seems simple, invisible disabilities. I guess. But you can dive deep. Even misdiagnosis. Even a misdiagnosis. Or a uh, non existent disability. Or a non existent disability. That label can be disabling. That label can be disabled. So it's a really big topic. So it is a really big topic. I'd like to thank everybody who helped. I would like to thank everybody who helped. And you remember everybody. I do remember everybody. Uh, thank you, Reverend Suzanne Fast, for presenting. Thank you, Mr. Patrick Galasso, for doing yeah. ASL interpreting. For all of our webinars, thank you, Patrick. Oh, yes, Patrick has signed for all of our webinars so far. Thank, thank you, Patrick. You and then a big thank you to our own David Rogers for his amazing focusing as always, the thank guitar you. playing. Thank you, thank, you. Uh, thank you to Michael Young and his father, Stephen Young, uh, members of our Accessibility Task Force who had to leave a few minutes ago. Thank you very much to Deborah Nunez, David's amazing wife, for being here to help. Yay. And uh, thank you to uh, Rev. Jen Young Sung Ru. She really wanted to be here on this, but uh, because of a bit of a, an urgent situation came up for her, um, she had to take her leave. And uh, thank you, Kat uh, Johnson, if I'm getting your last name correct. Uh, thank you so much for running the webinar in the background and for your technical help of everything this committee and the rest of the church does. Um, and and I say, look, community, social media has expressed a lot of interest. And I'll say that the, uh, the community on social media has expressed a lot of interest. So, uh, we're going to do a Charles the question, but if anyone wants to hang out, maybe they'll play us, they can like to cry. So we're going to do our Chalice Extinguishing, but then if anyone hangs out and wants to hang out, maybe Dave will play us some Diddy Duncan's and Cry. You want to hear that? In a moment. In a moment. In a moment. <laughs> Let me know. The Chalice. But first, the chalice extinguishing. As Helen Keller said, as Helen Keller said, I am conscious of a soul sense. I am conscious of a soul sense that lifts me above the narrow cramped circumstances of my life. That lifts me above the narrow cramping circumstances of my life. My physical. Limitations are forgotten. My physical limitations are forgotten. World lies upward. My world lies upward. The length and the breadth and the and the sweep of the heavens. The length. Mine. <laughs> the length and the breadth and the sweep of the heavens are mine. Are, are, or are ours. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. By the way, voice recognition is terrible with my voice. And by the way, voice recognition is terrible with my voice. But uh, yeah, I really want to welcome to the crown. David, tell us about my favorite song. Mm -hmm. I, my favorite. 
And by the way, if anybody knows the song, feel free to sing along. Tell us a little about the song. The song is a German freedom song from hundreds of years ago, as a matter of fact. There were some revolutionary movements going on in Germany, and uh, then they suppressed them, and a lot of people were pretty unhappy about being suppressed. And the song came out later on when Nazism was overthrown in, in Germany, and the song was widely allowed again. Of course, the Nazis banned it. You can not as in try, which just translates as thoughts of free. And uh, other than the chorus, the rest is in English. They got out and sin try, my thoughts really flower. They got out and sin try, my thoughts give me power. No hunter can trap them, no scholar can map them. No one can deny. He got up and sin pride. No one can deny. He got up and sin pride. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decreases. This right I must render. My thoughts will not cater to to or dictator. No one can deny. He got up and sin pride. No one can deny. He got up and sin pride. He got up and sin pride. No one can deny. He got up and sin pride. And should tyrants take me and throw me in prison, my boss will burst free like clouds in season. Foundations will crumble. And structures will tumble, and free people will cry. He got up and sin cry, and free people will cry. He got up and sin cry. Wow. Great night for run. Achoo. Thanks, everyone. Achoo. 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 Which means thank you in Lithuanian. <laughs> Suzanne and Patrick, thank you so much. Suzanne and Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I appreciate your inviting me. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.